Good afternoon, friends. I think uh, we can uh, start this webinar. In fact, I was waiting for Mr. Dugal, who's our founder, to join. But uh, it seems that he's still not joined. Anyway, uh, we, we'll start with this webinar. <clears throat> Uh, good afternoon, friends. Uh, I welcome you all to Circa's Expert Talk series. Uh, I'm sure all of you are taking special care of yourself and your family members in these terrible times. And I sincerely hope that these terrible times, uh, they pass away soon. I feel highly pleased to welcome uh, Ms. Karen Shepherdson, uh, who's a lead environmental specialist with the World Bank. And I'm really thankful to her for having accepted our invitation to be our expert speaker for today's talk. Thank you, Karen, and welcome. Uh, Thank you. Since, Good afternoon. Uh, now I'll straight away pass on the uh, baton to Professor Sagnik uh, to start the session with the introduction of the speaker. Professor Sagnik, over to you. Yeah, thank you, MNG. Uh, yeah, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, so it's a great pleasure to introduce today's speaker, uh, Orin Shepardson. Uh, Dr. Shepardson is a lead environmental specialist in the World Bank's Environment, Natural Resources, and Blue Economy Global Practice South Asia Region Unit. With over 30 years of experience on various issues at the intersection of environmental science and development policy. <laughs> Her areas of expertise span a wide range of environmental topics. <clears throat> Uh, from air pollution, solid waste management to climate change, agriculture and rural development, forestry, biodiversity conservation, and ozone depletion. Karin currently leads the World Bank's India Air Quality Management Team and manages several World Bank investment projects in South Asia on solid waste management and plastics waste reduction. She has led World Bank publications on environmental institutions and regulatory capacity development, managed large portfolios of IBRD and IDA investment projects with multi-sector teams and served for many years as the global coordinator of the World Bank's multi-billion dollar Montreal Protocol, Global Environmental Facility and Climate Adaptation Fund programs. Her career spanned over 27 years now. Uh, she joined the bank in 1994 through the Young Professionals Program and has left numerous operational and leadership positions, both in Washington, D.C. and country offices. And she is currently based in the Singapore Regional Hard Hub Office. So she has an interdisciplinary educational background with degrees in environmental science, civil engineering, economics, and public policy from McAllister College and Tufts University in the United States. Uh, we have been working, we have the privilege to work with uh, Karin and her team. Uh, so welcome, Karin, once again, and over to you. Thanks so much, Sagnik. For that great introduction and um yeah we are really um are, are um again uh, we're working a lot with you and appreciate um the work that we're doing together um i wanted to just start well first of all thanking everybody for taking the time to come to connect for this talk given everything that's going on in your own um, backyards and homes and families. So um, I, we, I really do appreciate that you are still um, interested to come and hear from us at the World Bank what we're doing on air pollution. So um, this, again, this topic, um, I, I'm gonna talk today about air shed management and this convergence of science and policy, uh, taking it to the impact scale. So this is really a lot about what air shed management uh, is all about. Um, I just wanted to uh, also say that I, I, I really feel there's no better place to be uh, having a chance to talk about this at, uh, than at IIT Delhi's, the Center of Excellence for Research on Clean Air, um, because you are an interdisciplinary center and you're bringing together, intended to bring together stakeholders to talk about issues just like um, what I'm going to be talking about today. So um, really appreciate that. Air quality management is a multi-sector, multidisciplinary approach, which is required. 
Um, and, and it's also noteworthy for IIT Delhi that you have established um, within the renowned IIT system, you're the pioneer of having a, a school of public policy um, that also focuses on bringing together the science, technology, and innovation. Um, this is really important for helping engineering students to, to think about practical uh, challenges and apply these in their early academic years and formative years. Um, as Sognik said, I, I, my academic background, and I'm, and I'm from the United States, so is from the United States, but I studied in the 1980s where this was just beginning this multidisciplinary um, types of education. So I'm a product of that. And um, at that time, it was, it was um, not very well understood but I, I see that today it is much better understood and we see uh, kind of a boom in these types of uh, centers and educational opportunities for students. So if we do have students out there, you know, you're benefiting from um, some, some learning. When I started, the even uh, environmental engineers or a degree in environmental management wasn't quite on the books. Um, and then those degrees and names are very common for jobs today. But um, so I just want to start, um, I'm going to focus on, as I said, airshed management um, and also just wanted to note that it really does require these different disciplines to solve the, the problem and the challenges and the root causes are really anthropogenic or people driven. So therefore to solve it, um, we need to get into the political, we need to get into legal economic policy uh, issues and, and um, bring that together with the technical and the engineering solutions as well. Karen, so shall like, so like, can you yeah, share your screen? Oh, you can't see my screen? Okay. No, I can't see your presentation. I thought it was up. <sighs> Shoot. How about now? One second, probably. Can you see it now? Not yet. No, no. Oh, shoot. Because it seems to be displayed on this side. Yeah, now, now it's... it's okay, yeah. all right. Great, so let's get started then. Um, sure, so I was just going to uh, talk today about, um, break, my, break this into four different parts. Why is the World Bank act focusing so much on airshed management? What are some of the global lessons around airshed management? How are we supporting airshed management um, and this shift in India? And what are some of the next important steps? So you're able to see, a, now just to check again to see that you can see the screen. Yes, yes, we can. Okay, perfect. Okay, great. Sure. So I thought I would just start again, uh, why, why airshed management? Um, I'm going to bring in some of the slides from some work that's been going on. Um, we have something we call the flagship study. It's, uh, that just means it's an important study. 
It's part of our um, economic um, development series for the South Asia region. And we have this study focusing on air quality management. So I'm going to be bringing in a number of slides uh, to share with you from that study. Uh, so just to start with, um, I just wanted to orient ourselves also in terms of where India stands compared to some of the other countries in the South Asia region, and then also to other countries in, in other regions. And you, and, uh, you can see on the PM 2.5 levels that the South Asia region stands out, and, um, and, and India, but in particular the Indo-Gangetic Plains states of India also stand out. And um, in terms of uh, being above the World Health Organization standards, but and also above um, most of the country's own standards. Um, this is also another uh, overview map that shows the PM 2.5 concentrations across the region. And uh, we, we can see from this analysis that the Practically all of the population of South Asia is exposed to levels of PM 2.5 above the World Health Organization standards. Um, and you can see that the countries in South Asia are actually have very different standards today. Um, they're not fully aligned across the region. Um, some of them are um, on WHO standards. India and Nepal currently are not at, at the WHO standards for the national standards. Another quick look um, on the map, you can see that there's a strong correlation between the highest pollution levels and the um, people who live below the poverty line. So this is a very significant map for us in the World Bank. It, we care about this issue quite a lot and, um, and it's very unique because often in other parts of the world, um, the air pollution is concentrated in um, higher income areas, but in but for India, this this Indo-Gangetic plain is is special and specific. So um, and so, there's a very important uh, opportunity and need to work on air pollution uh, in combination with economic development and um, thinking a lot about uh, people. So here we also look at um, the map again and can see that the population. Um, correlates with air pollution. So we look on the population uh, map on the left and then look again at this overlay on the right. You can see that this indo gangetic plain stands out. This is still a regional kind of a map and it's, so it stands out at the regional level. There's another important um, map that is generated from the work that uh, we've been doing under this study. We've been working with IASA on this study. This is an international institute for applied systems that um, is based in Austria. Many of you may, be, may know IASA. Uh, the government of India is also a member of IASA. There are, there are governments that are member countries and um, they are, are kind of a center of excellence for helping to do this type of modeling. We're using in the study the GAINS model, and uh, this, this has been uh, refined using Indian data uh, for the Indian and the South Asia uh, region. So when this back to this map, this shows um, the PM 2.5 concentrations that are generated by primary emissions and secondary emissions. And so this is a, a very important uh, map that um, tells us that, more, again, a, a big source of the problem in the indo gangetic plain where the concentrations of pollutants are highest, it are coming from the primary pollutants. However, these secondary pollutants are much more widespread all across India. Um, and so this is important as we started to think about, about air sheds because secondary um, pollutions is uh, spreading at a, a wider distance and becomes much more important at the airshed level. So all of this is what I'm bring, trying to bring out in this first section is really the data and the analysis that has bring up, brought us to the conclusion that the airshed issues are, are just at the core and center of uh, what is needed to work on air quality management here in India. 
So this is just another map, and these are the types of map or, or types of graphics that can be generated out of uh, the gains model that will show you also uh, break it down to the various sector contributions. Um, and then uh, we have this on the right, the breakdown uh, that will will take those same sector contributions, but um, it has uh, in the gray shown where it's really coming from secondary emission sources. So only the colored bars are the primary emissions. And um, so what we're seeing, uh, this is an example from Bihar, but we're seeing this um, in, all across uh, India that really the secondary, um, the, the share of secondary emissions in typical um, cities and states in India are, are large and typically around 50% or above. And so um, I'm not sure, I think the audience knows this, the difference between the uh, primary and secondary. This is what I'm told by Sagnik, it's primarily students and um, other practitioners who are probably listening. Yeah, yes, so it's just, yes, just, yes. Oh, okay, thanks. Um, another uh, map that can be generated and has been generated for India that you can look at is what does it look like source by source? Um, and so uh, you can see what the power generation contributions, large industry, uh, mobile sources. So what you see from here again is that every single one of these sources um, is at a very high level in the Indo-Gangetic plane. Um, perhaps maybe large industry a little bit less than the others, but, but for the most part, you see that that swath is still there. Um, but you do see certain other, some of the sources, power generation, residential and commercial, it's a little bit more spread across India and the mobile sources. Um, from this, we also could see um, how the, the, this slide is looking at the the origin of the PM and um, how it's impacting various states. And you can see which part of that is um, coming from within that state versus which part is coming from outside of the state. And, um, and then you also can see what's coming from outside of India um, and the natural source contribution. So there is this natural source of dust, sea salt, et cetera, and you get that on the bottom. Uh, you can see that Rajasthan, for example, has a very high contribution, Maharashtra, uh, uh, but, but some of the other states uh, a little bit less. Um, but the, um, again, the big message here is that the, there's a lot of sources that are coming from different parts of um, another, from a neighboring state. That's the, the, um, the pink uh, bar there. And then we have even from outside of the country. Uh, we also have broken this down in the model there. We, we call them source, um, source um, each of the source units. But um, in India, that means there are states. Um, we also can break it down to the cities, actually. So we have cities on this, this particular graph. And you can see similarly then uh, what it looks like in terms of the emissions um, that are really within the control of the city or not. Uh, so quite a bit of it, you can see that does come from still the neighboring states and some of it that even uh, comes from other countries for some of the cities here. So this work of the um, team has also one of the main purposes was to try to understand the airshed dynamics and um, figure out what that looks like. Um, so the model was able to do simulations on the exchange of um, exchange of air and, and look at pollution loads um, at different across the various seasons. And it came out with um, an image of uh, some emerging airsheds. Now there might be, again, airsheds are in different parts of the world are usually ultimately defined um, after you review the scientific information. So this is more coming from the scientific side in terms of what it looks like where there's the, the majority of the exchange of air. Um, and there were two main important air sheds that popped up for India where the high concentrations are in 
in the endogonjetic plane. And you could consider those two sometimes part of the same uh, airshed because there is exchange across, across them as well. Um, but the, the share, what, um, what the model showed is that the share of the sources that they could control within the particular airshed, uh, for example, in this airshed number one, which is the western side of the Indo-Gangetic plain, uh, was about 75%. And uh, sorry, it was 42% that individual states could control by themselves. But if they work together, then uh, collectively they could control about 75%. And then for the other airshed, it was about on average, if the states work by themselves, they could control about 40% whereas it's closer to 60% working together. So, so these types of uh, analyses have been run on this data. And this is a little bit more of a quick zoom in on the, those two airsheds and um, the Western side, um, the, the state of Punjab in India and the uh, Pakistan Punjab, for example, have some airshed connection. And then we can see down on the eastern side of the Indo-Gangetic Plain that West Bengal um, and uh, this airshed with Bihar, West Bengal, and uh, has connections with Bangladesh. And in um, and so so for those uh, certain parts of the Indo-Gangetic Plain, certain states or certain regions, then this international dimension is particularly also important. So what are the key takeaways from out of looking at this? It, it's, re it's really that there are these emerging uh, bigger airsheds. It's not that there are not micro airsheds. There are other airsheds within India, but these are the big, the big ones to think about, and especially the ones that are crossing across state boundaries. Um, it, it does point to the fact that a, a regional approach is necessary to really get to that scale that you need to tackle the emissions. And um, that these plans, that this nesting uh, is something that is needed. So you need to look at various scales. And because the picture looks different when you look at each scale. And so um, we think that, um, again, in the work, that the, air, the state level is a very good um, unit to work with because the state um, is, is a very uh, strong jurisdictional boundary as well but it also is a size geographically large enough um, to, to look at. And then um, we are also looking at the um, emissions at the cities, and uh, now we're doing some work on the urban local bodies as well. And so there's this need to, co to coordinate, and it also points to the need to set up then some type of implementation mechanisms, start to think about what those should look like, um, for strengthening harmonization uh, across the methodologies used by the states and what kind of accountabilities um, mechanisms would also be necessary. So stepping back, what are some of the global lessons on airshed management and that we um, think are important to think about when we consider airshed management in India? And um, First and foremost, we come at it um, that air, shed, air quality management is a development challenge. Um, and there's this need to decouple um, air pollution and economic growth. And we are able to see that this has happened in other countries. And it's, it, it's a goal that is a critical goal for a country to have. Um, we also some of the key issues and lessons are, are really that the health benefits and the economic cost of air pollution is really the most important driver of any country around the world. And uh, that's usually been front and center as a country makes its decisions uh, for action and to make investments into air quality management and into these airshed management systems. So we, we the health health issue has to be there uh, front and center, and then the um, the enabling to enable air quality management and airshed management really does need human resource 
physical resources, institutional investments, and policies to really set up a whole kind of infrastructure that will be long-term management system that needs to be put in place. So again, it's never in countries that have begun on this road. Uh, this, these were not; these are not one-off. Um, they may go in steps over time, but it's a progressive road ahead to building that long-term management system. And uh, then the science of air pollution, something else to keep in mind that we're very cognizant of the World Bank because we've watched this transition over time, that the science is evolving. And so the investment approaches and how we're helping countries to think through it is changing too. So the science and the policy and the planning, they all are linked. So this whole issue of long range secondary emission sources they're much better understood today and we would not be having the same conversations that we're having today 15 years ago um, it would have been very pioneering it would have been much 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 newer um, but but now it's very well understood and and that is necessary also the technology and the tools we have are changing expanding um, and and then this interconnections between the air quality management and the air issues with other big development issues, including climate change. Um, so we see in this graph is just what, what has been a good trend. Um, this graph is pointing out also that, that in addition to investments that are coming from the envir environmental uh, channels, say, uh, that actually equally important are these other economic policies and structuring restructuring um, measures that are taken that have also helped countries to decouple. So I think that's also important to think that uh, think about that this really is multi-sectoral and is a whole of government approach that is needed. So quickly also there's a kind of um, a trajectory that um, has been mapped out that could be followed to get up to this uh, airshed management uh, first, of course, collecting data, making sure you get the evidence that you need, then developing the modeling, uh, then introducing some types of reforms to enable some of the work and bringing this in to the levels uh, that you can start to manage it, in this case, at a state level, and then uh, bringing it up to a, 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 a uh, regional level where you could capture the entire airshed. The main point here is that um, there it is a it does take a bit of time, but there are there are actually fairly good steps to take, and um, there are things you can do while you're taking those steps. But why do we want to get through all those steps? Is because at the end we're able to save money, we're able to do things more efficiently. And we're going to be able to make better decisions to, to manage the air problem. So what also are some attributes, attributes here? We, we've, we've done quite a bit of an analysis on this um, comparing around the world. And these five attributes come out that there needs to be a strong authorizing regulatory framework. There needs to be a nested planning system because we're dealing with wide geographic areas. So so, and we're crossing administrative boundaries so that, that the interconnections, what we call the, the, um, the vertical coordination is needed as well as horizontal. This, the committed executive, so um, the making sure the money and the funds are allocated, uh, setting in place the policies and regulations and incentives, which are also needed on compliance and for other um, action. And then this uh, various coordination of the actors and establishing uh, accountability for various institutions that have a role to play. So making, again, things like transparency and clear rules of the game. Um, we look also around at the world. This is just two countries, but we actually have done a, an analysis of um, a, a much larger set of countries, uh, but these show three dimensions that are very important. This planning dimension, the implementation dimension, and then how you set up accountability. So at the planning, this nesting uh, in the need to have coherence at the various levels. Implementation, 
sometimes it's the same as the planning. Sometimes it, it's uh, different on the implementation, but there needs to still be a, a, a strong correlation and uh, some, some nesting and coordination around the implementation. And then uh, again, for account accountability, um, this is where the legislative um, and the rules uh, get, get applied. And again, that's different for each country, but these are federated countries just like India, uh, where um, there is already some good experience with, with airshed management. And we are seeing that most of the, the federated countries do have um, for air pollution management, for air quality management, have set up systems like this. So that's on sort of on the policy and institutional side. Now coming to the technical side, the technical side, because air pollution management is a very technical issue. Uh, environmental issues is one of the most complex technical fields. Um, and however, the key message is that there are standard um, methodologies out there that have been used and are used around the world. And um, there's, uh, so, so, so the, the basic building blocks and steps are fairly well known. Um, you can see from this uh, map, there's, and there's various kinds of modeling that would come in at different steps. But um, one of the things I just want to point out in the context of India is that as you get to the right side of this graph, the health impacts and the cost effectiveness side, this is the part where, where India still has to do more work. Uh, but India actually has a lot going on related to the air quality monitoring, emission and the, the, the sampling and source apportionment side of it. So, so um, where our work is, is a little bit more on the right hand side. And then last, finally, just a quick slide on um, this, which is sharing a, a, a graph we like to look at and we'd like to see India onto this map um, sometime soon too with a nice downward trajectory. Um, but these are countries that we have supported financially over the years. Um, and we can look at it and we can say, yes, you know, Mexico, they established their airshed commission in the, in the 1990s, and that was very effective to help them. We have worked closely with China, and um, China has also taken an airshed management approach, and we've seen um, some very important progress, uh, and very importantly, the ability to sustain that progress because they have taken an airshed approach. You see some other more dramatic ones here, like um, um, in Mongolia, that's, um, not a case where there's a big airshed. It's more a case where the city itself is is in um, more of a valley, and it's a very a more contained uh, place that had a particular very um, what you know. Mostly, it was on the clean cook stoves um, investments that were able to pull that right down. So last, okay, I have a slide also on China. And why did I put this in? Because we are really translating some of this work from China because they have um, approached this uh, very systematically. We've worked very closely with them. So we also know and understand. Yostein on our team that most of you, many of you may know, uh, spent many years working on this program. And um, they, did very similar to what we have in India. They have um, supported it uh, at the highest level with the government, between the government and the country. Uh, we used a variety of, of what we call instruments, meaning uh, our technical assistance and also investment support. Uh, we used a combination of that and then also used the gains model uh, in, in China. And uh, this is what their cost effectiveness curve looks like. And they, um, and in China, we also we brought in a grant element, and this is something also to think about in India, um, particularly for the Indo-Gangetic Plain. I think it's a we think it's a region that can attract uh, the interest of donors, so that you could bring in a full kind of a range of tools to help help um, drive down the air pollution sources in this region. In China, you can see the bottom of the curve. They, they saw, they, you could see from this curve that um, investments, for example, 
in agriculture in this sustainable agriculture practices and fertilizer application, you could actually drive down your air pollution at a lower cost than other areas. And so they have invested in a big way in that and that, that has been a big part of their success. So how and what are we doing um, in India? I'm going to do a, a kind of quick overview on that. Everything that we're doing in India is driven uh, by the NCAP program, where we're trying to support the implementation and the achievement of the goals of the NCAP. Um, we, we, it, with the recognition that it is um, a good start, but some of the issues like the airshed are, are, are not in bed in this initial version of the NCAP. The NCAP was envisioned to go out further to 2030. So it is also a, um, the work that we're working on with MOFCC and other partners is something that can help feed into the next um, iteration. We also think that the bringing in this linkages between the, um, the, the air quality management and climate change are very important. And NCAP has that in it, but we're, but at the implementation stage, we need to figure out uh, what more to, to do. And so that's another uh, area that we're thinking about. And the GAINS model uh, integrates climate change. So this is, a, again, a powerful tool to try to use to ascertain both the air quality and the climate benefits. So quickly, um, again, this technical assistance, we, it's a, it's a, it's a three-year uh, technical assistance that the Ministry of Environment Climate Change had requested the bank to work, and they asked us to work at a lower level, at, at a more granular level in certain states. So we have chosen uh, the eastern side of the IGP to, to do that with um, Bihar and uh, West Bengal and UP. In a, in a little bit more concentrated way, but we're working at the national level, the state level, and the regional level um, on, on various uh, things. We're working with the CPCB on some of the guidance, working with um, the ministry on their uh, reformulation on some of the NCAP and materials related to learning on NCAP. Um, we're also working then at the regional level, which is a very important level on um, all across the indo gangetic Plain states. Uh, while we were able to be on the ground, we did have some face-to-face -face workshops and things, but we've been mainly doing virtual uh, discussions uh, since then for the past year. So um, again, these are just who the key Stoke stakeholders are at the national level, who I, I, I've just quickly mentioned already, so I won't dwell on that too much. Um, but one of the goals of the technical assistance is to really help um, shift and build some of this capacity so that we could then come in and actually support a larger investment in India, for working with various states um, to, to help on implementation. So. That's one of the output goals. Then um, I want to go into sh briefly a couple of the specific activities that we're working on. And uh, Jo Stein just came in, which is good. I have some company here in Singapore now. <laughs> um, we are working on, um, we nicknamed it AQM Mod. So those who are working with us have heard that name before, but we, it's really um, a, uh, AQM planning and implementation practice uh, group that, that has been established. And we've been working very closely with Sognik Day, who's leading a team at IIT Delhi. And we have, um, they've partnered with NERI as well. Uh, and IASA, who I mentioned earlier, is, is supporting this work as well. It's taking the, the, the information that you saw in the first section um, which were some of the gains model outputs. It's taking that and handing it over really uh, to, to Indian institutions to take this on into their own version. And um, so Sognik is driving this uh, group that is uh, working to really refine a lot of the, the data and uh, each, each of the state teams uh, are, are working there too. And this is going side by side with the work that we are doing with the CPCB to also help to test and pilot 
um, how some of this work can be done and then use it to help inform national standards and gui guidance. So we're very much trying to keep them involved and in the loop as well um, at how this is moving forward. So then another piece that um, some of you may have heard about before if you've, because um, we did have one webinar that shared some of this work from Bihar, um, but also as an example of work that we've done is um, helping the state of Bihar, which was a state that didn't have very many air quality monitoring um, systems out there. We've helped them to design an entire state system. And uh, that system is right now, as we speak, being deployed. So we understand it's actually now going to be uh, operating by the end of this month, and you'll start to see data coming across the various districts of Bihar. So in a, about a one-year period of time, they're all virtually, uh, they've been able to go through this whole process of analyzing, um, doing, um, look, looking really uh, on the ground uh, and using things like Google Earth to look um, at the geography and topography and, and, and study the dynamics so that they could set up a, a true, a true uh, statewide system with border control stations and um, coverage across all of the rural and the urban districts. So um, this is another, um, while doing this, these steps have been developed as uh, guidance because one of the goals is that it can be shared with other states or others that would like to think about doing this. We, we um, cause uh, again, across the Indo-Gangetic Plain to be able to work as one in an air shed, have each state having their own system and understanding their own data is very important. Finally, coming back to some other work that's going on right now that is linked to what I was just talking about is nesting of modeling. So the, the GAINS model and this, a, this modeling group I was just talking about, um, that is... Um, has different, different modules that are at the city level or at the um, state level. And it can also be combined with other models that are at the city level, for example, that might be looking on a more micro scale. So this is a brief image that shows you that depending on which scale you're working at, you see different things. So you will see a different percentage of secondary and primary emissions, and you'll see different, um, different um, emphasis on different sources also looking at the scale. So this work that's ha going on right now is um, trying to make the connections uh, so that a state and an urban agglomeration city could all each understand their own um, sources and understand what the airshed related impacts for those um, or contributions for those sources are. So that a full state plan could be developed that looks at this in an interconnected way. So this is very pioneering work. Um, I think it's the first time that it's been done. We have some international experts that are also helping um, the team. And um, that's what I, I understand that it is really um, pioneering these interconnections. Um, and as part of that process, then this team has also developed a kind of a, a, a roadmap for how to use the modeling to inform and develop a state action plan. So setting up the model, um, looking at the source connection, source contributions, making these uh, nesting connections that I was just talking about, um, setting the goals and targets, and then being able to run scenarios, and finally getting down to the granular, the granularity of um, not only what sources and what things, but actually the where. Um, so within our city, where's the where should we target first to pull down the emissions most and the same for across the state. So um, this work is going on now. This is something 
that, um, again, Sognik is very involved on this team. We have another IIT Delhi professor, uh, Harsh, Harsh, Dr. Kota, also involved, um, and, and the IASA team working with the World Bank team on this. So finally, what are the last steps, um, or what are next steps? So I think a key, key message is that there's really a lot going on in India right now. So important next steps are really focusing in on implementation. And so there are a lot of, um, we have the, the Delhi has its, the first air commission in India, the Delhi and the surrounding jurisdictions airshed commission. Um, it, it's important to support that new commission and to, to help them in their role to really get to this wider scale for impact. Um, there's the 15th Finance Commission Million Cities Challenge Fund that's been uh, announced this year. And this is also a great opportunity to work with these mega cities in India to really uh, push for the air pollution at a higher scale. But also it's an important opportunity to work with those cities to understand that they're part of a wider airshed too. And in order for them to pull down their emissions, they're going to need to actually take that bigger perspective. Um, and then there, the National Knowledge Network, when we started our technical assistance, um, it was formulated in one way, the ministry has revamped and, uh, and set up a new system. So, so helping that uh, National Knowledge Network system to really um, build human capacity for the air quality management skills and jobs needed. There's a very big need in India to have people who are working on air quality management. Um, and the, the human resources to the task aren't big enough right now. And so there's a, a good important need to build those skills and capacity over the coming um, dec five years to, to a decade ahead. Um, following up on implementation of certain uh, roadmaps, so we worked very closely and we still are working closely with IIT Delhi on something that was called OPMAS, the Air Pollution Monitoring and Analysis System Conference that we had in um, January, we jointly did with uh, IIT, and it is leading to a white paper process that will make some recommendations that came from advice from Indian stakeholders and also international perspectives and synthesizing that together to make some recommendations uh, for what entire systems, what, it, what, is, what, is a good, what would a good practice for India look like? So following up on some of these um, types of initiatives are, are important roadmap steps ahead as well. And I understand IIT Delhi has just put in a proposal for some funding to, to take those next steps. So we're excited to see that. Um, again, in working to institutionalize the work being done now on air quality, mod on the air shed modeling, there's a need to think through the institutions. And um, that's certainly not something the World Bank's going to solve. We, um, but the government needs to solve, but the tools can help to think about what might work and how how, how how that could work for India. Um, and then there's a need to work really with the Ministry of Finance and the State Departments of Finance to think through how to really line up the budgets and funds to make sure you're gonna have high impact for air, air, air quality and to pull down. The, the, the types of targets that India and where India needs to go, the funds that are on the table right now are not enough. Um, but we know that money is um, difficult. It's a difficult um, economic time. And so we need to be smart and targeted and go for cost effective strategies. So this is where this planning and modeling comes in. So there's also a need to scale and replicate many of the good things happening in India. So India has got a lot of good programs already um, happening well underway, they need to continue. Um, we have this, this a lot going on on the bringing in LPG cooking. There's um, other places that it has not reached. There may need advanced biomass cook stoves in places where 
affordability is not there for LPG, but there's also other solutions like induction ovens happening uh, that can even take it another level for air pollution. Zigzags, chimneys, et cetera, it goes on. There's already some urea, nitrogen, urea coated um, fertilizer, sorry, with neem oil is what it, um, so fertilizer coated with neem and, and various um, ongoing programs need to be sustained and continued. Um, then there's also some next stage measures, things that haven't been focused on as air pollution issues as much like manure management, that fertilizer application, um, the open sewage uh, issue, which is very prevalent in the Indigenetic Plain, uh, prevention of forest fires and, and other, other next steps um, on technologies, for example, for brick kiln zigzag is one thing, but there could be other, other measures as well. And then bringing these measures, I think I started talking about that earlier, in together with the development goals, it's going to be, it is very important. And especially because the high pollution levels are in the Indo-Vengetic Plain where development investments are needed. And so we have to find the ways to bring them together. We also have some examples in India where um, we might've pursued one thing, but not air quality, or, or we pursued air quality, but, um, and energy efficiency is one of those examples we have um, where for example, thermal power plants are more energy efficient, but they're not controlling the air pollution as well. And wherever we have chances to bring them together and, and make those trade-offs directly together, it's going to go, it's going to um, pay off better. Um, I just quickly had a slide too on, um, I mentioned that some of the technical assistance in terms of the next step, the World Bank um, is, ready to uh, start to help working with states to, uh, to structure uh, basically on the basis of a state action plan. So once there's a very clear action plan, we would be there to help um, as a financing partner. And so we've been doing some thinking on what a theory of change would look like with an investment project like that. And coming out here, I think um, we see that some of the objectives would still be to get and make sure to get in place that basic air quality management infrastructure. Uh, the financing of that is not fully secured at this stage. There's also um, a need to continue to push on the institutional and the capacity side, especially given uh, the, the human resources that need to come in um, to, to make this happen. And then there's sector specific interventions um, and that, that will come out of the state action plans and the modeling work uh, in terms of uh, where, what are the highest priorities that need the attention first. Um, so the World Bank, we just finished also our spring meetings. We do annual meetings and spring meetings two times a year when we pull together the finance ministers um, of, the, of the world and we have discussions on priority topics of concern. And um, I, this year we were able to talk, to talk, we had a very special event just for the South Asia ministers of finance to talk about air pollution. So I wanted to just bring in a couple of slides from that and uh, explain to you the, a little bit about the analysis because it's really the airshed analysis, this flagship report that I talked about that um, again presented the compelling evidence enough to our management to 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 recognize that yes we this is something that we have to raise to the ministers of finance because they have to understand that that um, it has been solved in other countries with ministers of finance very much um, at the table and and not really just as a sector issue on the side. So we have this good um, uh, discussion as a preparation for it. There was some uh, materials that were provided. Uh, there was modeling of what could a scenario, a good, a clean air 2030 scenario for the region look like if all of the countries of South Asia worked on solving the air pollution problem in this period. And you can see a pretty dramatic picture actually that emerges about what is possible. 
So it is possible if you, um, if all countries together were working on this issue. And we brought to the minister, because this was for ministers of finance, um, into the discussions, there were some key messages for them, which was that they should specifically try to build this air quality into their green recovery programs. So green recovery programs happening all around the world uh, needed because of the financial crisis of COVID. Um, help, please help to mobilize finance at scale and uh, support policy innovations. Um, things like the 15th Finance Commission has set up here, a performance-based system. It's actually, it's a first in the world that is a fiscal transfer policy incentive for air pollution, very pioneering. And it was discussed at that that level, we also had the chairman of the Finance Commission speak to the audience on that particular topic. But economic policies, restructuring policies, these are really important and they should be filtered in through the, through the budget discussions. We talked to them about cost effectiveness, how that is uh, a tool in air quality management and is needed and uh, they should care about that tool. We also talked about the transboundary cross-border collaboration um, and, and again, the opportunities for that. We gave them some background materials. This was uh, something in the background materials that also came out of the modeling that um, showed if here you can see, uh, if you set a target, say, or if you, we use the, as a target the World Health Organization, uh, there's levels one, two, three, and, and the standard. So there you can compare uh, countries working on their own with um, if the countries work together. And if the countries concurrently were working on air pollution to pull it down, then all of the countries have a much greater chance. So the spillover effect of air pollution comes out pretty clearly in, in the modeling results. And it, it, it was an uh, issue that resonated with the finance ministers as well. There was also a, a graphic we, that I'm sharing here on cost effectiveness that was shared with them. Uh, one of the key interesting things I find from this is that the, you know, the, the legislation, you know, just making a policy decision doesn't actually cost anything. Um, it, there are costs to implement, implementing it, but taking that first step. So there's been a lot of decisions made uh, policy decisions that are very positive for air quality management in the region. And so this um, graph shows that there's already a great start. Um, however, it also modeled and went through what, um, what would be the benefit in terms of cost for the uh, GDP and the benefit in terms of um, achieving reductions in air pollution. And um, it compared what might be a more random ad hoc selection, maybe what we call um, no regret measures versus something much more targeted where you're really focusing in on, on uh, cost effectiveness. And you can see from that that you can get further and you can do it at a lower cost. So these, are the, these were, were particularly um, graphs that were put together to try to resonate with the ministers of finance. Another um, message that was brought out and the gains model, I think I mentioned before, it really shines because it on the climate change issues because it has that fully integrated. So uh, we looked also for these scenarios for the 2030 and then we also looked at a 2040 scenario, what would be what we called the clean air scenario, um, what would be the climate co-benefits. So this is this would be if you imagined that you didn't do anything for the purpose of climate change, but you did it just for air quality, then you would still get these carbon dioxide benefits and black carbon benefits and methane benefits. So those are and they're pretty significant numbers that are necessary for bringing to, uh, you know tackling climate change as well. So we know that we're not in that scenario, of course, that we're not going to do things, but. It's one paradigm to look at that shows you how important the air measures really are for climate change. So that's a um, quick overview. I hope that you were able to get from that, again, the compelling 
evidence and why we're sort of organizing all of our work around this um, airshed need in India. Yeah, thank you Karin, for a fantastic overview talk. Uh, in fact, it's really great to see the, how World Bank is helping all the countries, uh, particularly in this part of the world, in dealing with air pollution. Uh, before I uh, open the floor to uh, to the audience for questions, in the audience, you can either raise your hand uh, or you can type in your question. Uh, so I have a question actually, Karin. So uh, you mentioned about the financing and I think this is very important. So uh, 15 Finance Commission has actually shown, you know, a way to deal with it. But still, I think uh, there is kind of a disparity in financing in India, particularly when you see the 15 Finance Commission, how much fund they have allotted for these urban agglomerations versus how much fund actually is there for NCAP. Uh, in fact, NCAP is actually kind of underfunded. So how do you suggest, you know, we sort of move to a more balanced financing and dealing with this entire airship management? Yeah, thanks. This is a great question and I would agree with your assessment. Um, or did you want to take some other question? Um, no. no, I mean, you can go ahead and answer. And just... Oh, okay. So I heard somebody trying to talk. I fully agree with your assessment of the situation. I think the way that we, we would be looking at it is, um, and what we're seeing too, is first you need to understand what is the finance thing that you need and for what. And so that, that case has probably not been made very clearly uh, to be able to, to, to move you know, to really, in a compelling way, put on the table and say, we are missing this fund, so we, we have this finance gap. So the work that we're, we're, for example, in Bihar, we're having some very good discussions there, and we're working with them also to do a kind of an expenditure review. So, so, so correlating the air quality work with the budgeting system in the state. And and our goal is to 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 enable them to be able to put on the table and say, yes, we have these needs, but we want to see it correlated with um, the cost effectiveness that comes out of the modeling exercise too. So, so the cost effectiveness, they say we'll have these needs, but we have to make some decisions based on both where things are most cost effective and, and can pull down the pollution fastest and what's feasible, what's feasible for implementation. So those kind of conversations need to be had, but there's a bit more work I think that needs to be done on understanding the budget side of things and and the priorities. Yeah, thanks. So, audience, any question for Karin? I don't see any raised hand. But if anyone is having any question, uh, please unmute yourself and. Go ahead. So I, I also wanted to add on the financing since uh, more that we that's because we see these gaps exactly what you said that there's potentially a lot of money that will go into the 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 a million plus cities um, if if they can earn that money through the performance um, but the rural uh, sources of emissions we think are really going to be very important and we don't see resources there. And then there are smaller non-attainment cities that also need attention and funds. So again, as we um, put together support from the World Bank to help the government of India uh, or a particular state, we will definitely be looking at uh, channeling maybe some of our resources in the places where there are those bigger gaps. Yeah. So, yeah, Karin, there is a question. So, somebody asked, like, how do airshares evolve in time? Uh, whether the presented plan considers this evolution in long-term plan? Um, it's a great question. I, I think that with climate change, um, everything, since it's, it's dependent on um, atmospheric science, and we see that, that that's all changing, uh, with climate change. So I think for sure it will change over time. Um, however, 
there, however, what we see, for example, in other countries, that often the airshed definitions are following kind of watershed definitions. Um, there's a very close correlation, and it's because of geography. So geography is not going to change radically, but the atmospheric conditions may be changing. So you have certain parameters changing and other changes, others not. So I think, I don't know if that question is about, you know, if you're going to establish an institution or, or start to treat it administratively, then how long will it stick? Uh, of, course, of course, you'll have dynamics of air throughout the season, but that would have been considered. But we, we see like, California is a very famous one that most people know about in the United States. And, you know, they have a big mountain range, uh, just like the Indo-Gangetic Plain has a, a big mountain range behind it. So, so you know, that mountain range isn't going anywhere um, to, to have an influence. And so, so that's always going to be a wall or a border. Thank you. Okay, I don't see any more questions in the chat box. Anyone? Uh, wants to ask any questions? Otherwise, I think, uh, yeah, okay, I don't see any more questions. So, so Karin, uh, on behalf of Sarka, it's a great pleasure, you know, to have you and hear your experience. Uh, we appreciate your time. You know, we agreed to be our speaker on a short notice, and we look forward to uh, working with you on this airshed management for the, in the Gangetic Plan. Thank you. It's my pleasure to be here, really. It's a great opportunity for us to be able to come and talk to everyone about this. And um, I just wish yes, everyone yes. in India to stay safe and be well. Um, and we uh, look forward to working with you, too. Yeah. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you, Kevin. Have a, have a great Thank weekend, you. everyone. Stay safe. Bye-bye.